This is tutorial twenty one, and we will continue our discussion about potential flows. Also, we will start to discuss the stress and deformation relationships in viscous flows. Being potential is a strong requirement on a flow. The flow has to be both irrotational and incompressible. The simplest kind of potential flow is uniform flow. Differentiating a constant is zero, so that the incompressible and irrotational requirements are always satisfied. For example, if we use the velocity field v equals u zero, then clearly, to prove this item in the table, we do a rotation on our velocity field, and then to find the psi and phi. As in the previous video, if we want a purely radial potential flow, then the flow must be the one described in this table. To see why, we first consider the irrotational requirement. The irrotational requirement requires that the set component of curl goes to zero. Now, since what we want is a purely radial flow. The tangential component is zero, so this term is zero. Therefore, the radial component itself cannot be a function of theta. And then we consider the incompressible requirement, so this is zero, and we solve this equation for v r. So we must have the radial component be a constant divided by r, and the resulting stream function and the velocity potential must be in this form. The m here in the numerator is the flux across the curve, or the mass flow rate per unit length perpendicular to the x y plane. I will explain that later in this video. If we want a purely tangential potential flow. Then we can also use the irrotational and incompressible requirements to obtain the result in this table. The gamma here is indeed the circulation of the velocity along any closed path enclosing the origin. And above double h, let's sketch the x y plane. If we put one source here, and we put one sink here, and we continually Decrease the distance between the source and the sink. Then eventually a doublet is formed. Now let's do a quick example. Any stagnation pond must lie on the x-axis. Pick any pond not on the x-axis, say this pond, and the velocity contributed by this source goes this way. Then in this pond and any other pond not on the x-axis must have a y component of velocity. So any point with zero velocity must lie on the x-axis. Now, for any point on the x-axis, the velocity contributed by this guy is. To verify this is true, let's take the origin. Then the distance between the two points is two l. So we have m divided by two pi and theta divided by two l. Similarly. The velocity contributed by this guy is given by. Then we sum the two velocities. And set that equals to zero, and that implies. So that implies, which is our desired result. This problem is really a good exercise since it can remind us a few things. Sadly, I will not do it here since this is on your homework. But I can talk a bit about it. First, we call this Bernoulli equation can be applied for a potential flow. Provided that the flow is also steady and in viscid. Second, from the flow geometry, you should think of what sort of 
partial derivative shall you take? In order to find the pressure gradient along the streamline and in the normal direction. In the next part, I will explain mathematically what are m and gamma in the source and fault test. If you are not interested, just remember what m and gamma is and jump to the last part of the video to listen about Fisker's flow. Before we explain what really happens for vortex and source, let's do a review of multivariable calculus and see how the velocity potential and the stream function simplify line integrals if they exist. So let's expand this integral. And since R is xy, and from the previous video, so we can plug in the results. I think you have seen this result already in the multivariable calculus but you may not know what happens for flux. Before we continue, let's understand what the normal vector n stands for. Let's say we have a control volume. At this point, we want our n point hang outward like this. One trick to do this is to rotate the tangential vector, which is in this direction, by rotate this vector by 90 degrees. A trick to do this is to rotate the tangential vector L prime s by crossing it with k, or in other words, is to rotate it clockwise by 90 degrees. So this expression equals to this expression here. Then we can continue. So, so remember the definition of cross product, and that is. So this thing equals. And from the previous video, we have got this expression, so we can substitute it in. So, just like potential function measures circulation along a curve, the stream function measures the flux across a curve. In multivariable calculus, we have learned about Green's theorem, which is also useful in finding line integrals, but it cannot be used to find all line integrals, it is because first, the curve might not be closed. Second, even if the curve is simply closed, the region bounded by the curve may not be simply connected. Like this, there is a hole here, so it is not simply connected. But this fact is remarkable. For a rotational flow, that is, the velocity potential exists, then the circulation is zero, given that the region enclosed by C is simply connected. It is because this goes away and integrate zero is always zero. We can also say that the flux is zero if the flow is incompressible. So let's do some calculus exercise. The segment here is clearly not closed and I do not want to really do integration here, but luckily the question provides us the stream function. So if we make a direction for this segment, so we make the direction from B to A, that is R points in this way, then the normal vector N points 90 degree clockwise, that is in this direction. Then by fundamental theorem of line integral, so this is from B to A, this equals, so this becomes, and point A has coordinates 1, 0, point B has coordinates 0, 1. And we substitute in the values. All other terms are 0, and double negative is positive, so this equals 1. And we copy down the units. The sign here is positive, so the flux also points in this direction. For your practice, you may redo this problem with the curve direction running from A to B. 
then you shall also get the same result. Let's do the next example. The curve here is closed, and the boundary region is simply connected. So we can use the Green's theorem. To find the circulation, we have to find the curve first. So we compute the curve. There is no radial component, so this time is zero. And then this is and we plug this in. But now this is just a constant, so we can pull that out, and the remaining integral becomes just the area of the region A B C D. Now for a sector, the area is And we are done with this example. Again, in this example, we have a simply closed curve and a simply connected region. So that we can calculate the curve. Which is zero. Then, by Green's theorem, we can conclude that this integral is zero, since this integral here is always zero. Let's go back to our business and discuss the circulation for vortex. To answer the question here, I propose two answers. Answer number one, since the flow is a potential flow, the flow is irrotational by definition, then this term goes zero. By Green's theorem, this integral is zero. Another answer comes from the fundamental theorem for line integral. Now, since the velocity potential exists, then we can apply the fundamental theorem for line integral. But we are stuck in this step. This is because if we draw the unit circle out, and theta by definition, so there is a problem. Since our curve here will hit the y-axis, so that the integral is improper. Shall we give up this problem? No. If you recall how did you do this improper integral in calculus 2, this line integral here can be decomposed into several parts. If we decompose this curve in the curve 1, curve 2, and curve 3, then this integral can be decomposed into these three curves. Also, we shall label points A, B, C. Also, we shall label the end points of each curve. Then we can write this free integral as and this cancels out. And we can find each angle B, C, D, E by taking limits. Say, we just do one of them for illustrating purpose. For this point, the y coordinate is 1, and the x coordinate is very close to 0 from the negative side. So, its theta is, and this is m1 divided by a very small negative number, give a very big negative number, and that is, similarly, we have, And we combine all this result to give this integral equals and this is just gamma. So we show that the circulation along the unit circle is indeed gamma. But having a non-zero circulation does not imply that the flow is rotational. The circulation in this case is purely due to the singularity in the origin. If we put a cross in a flow, its orientation is unchanged in our free vortex. So this is our free vortex, and V is proportional to 1 over R. But for the force vortex, with velocity proportional to R, then we can see that the orientation of the cross change as the cross travel from A to B. From this, we see that 
The free fall test that we have been discussing about is irrotational. Since we intentionally make it to be irrotational in the first page of this tutorial, so so let's just erase this out. Also, if we continue to do the math, we can show that the circulation is the same around any curve that enclosed the origin, that is the singularity point. We can also repeat the same question by replacing the vortex by the source and replacing the circulation by flux. Then by the same procedure, we can show that the flux is in fact M. Before we move on, let me make a concluding remark. For a potential flow, it is the singularities that contribute to any flux and circulation. Otherwise, by Green's theorem, a potential flow cannot have this kind of things. If you are interested, you can study more about complex variables. Now we start to talk about viscous flows. Different from all the flows we consider in this chapter, we start to deal with viscosity. We have mentioned the definition about shear strain rate in a previous video already. So here is a tensor that describes all the deformation rate. The non-diagonal elements are just the angular deformations, and the diagonal term here are the linear deformations. What's so special about a tensor is that a tensor must be symmetric and have many other properties that it has to fulfill. For a Newtonian fluid, we can relate such deformation to stresses. We usually consider pressure too, so the whole thing becomes like this. This thing is fundamental to the derivation of the navier stokes equation. But let's just leave the navier stokes to the next tutorial and do an example about this first. So here is the example, and there is nothing special. We just have to compute all the things by definition. Let's compute all the derivatives first. So, and in this point, we substitute x equals 0 0.5 and y equals 1. Then, from the previous slide, we hope you are good at solid mechanics. We can draw the fluid element as if it is a solid element. These are the shearing stresses. And that is 45. As for the normal stresses, they are all compressive. In the x direction and in the y direction. So we are done with this example. So today we finished so many things about potential flows, circulation, and flux. We also started to talk about a separate concept called viscous flow. In particular, we only study the stress and strain relation in fluid mechanics. In particular, we only study the stress and strain relationship in this kind of flow. So, see you in the next video, and put any problems and feedback in the comments below. Thanks.